who shared. You know the phrase, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. Uh, we don't know where that came from. We don't know who wrote it first or when that started. We do know that it was sometime after Jesus left and before the 1700s. Because by the 1700s, they were using that phrase commonly as a greeting and as part of their church services. But you know what? Either way, wherever that started, it's a, it's a clear declaration that no matter what was going on, good or bad in our lives, that God doesn't change. Situations change, people change, things change, health changes, but God doesn't change. That God is good all the time. And when stuff is good, God is good all the time. And that's easy to say it then. But when tough is hard, tough is hard? When stuff is hard, it's harder to say. And last week, if you were here, we filled out these cards. Uh, I left them up here on purpose. Uh, you know, we talked about the things that we were thankful to God for. And it's easy to say thank you. These are great and God is good. And then we listed prayer requests and things we're struggling for and longing for and asking God that one day we would be able to look back and thank him. And then the third card on and what we were willing to offer from ourselves to God. But all those things tie together. That in all of that, God is good. Do we see that? Pretty sure that there's nobody here in this room that as good as life may be right now that we're not struggling with something. Because we do. It's part of life. And life is hard, but God is still good. I want to go through quickly here. Uh, first service I got up to speak and it was already after 10 o'clock. So we just kind of ditched the notes and, and, uh, and went at it. And, and I'll kind of go in between those today because it's already 10 to. So... I want to read from, from Lamentations. And Lamentations, when we're looking at God as good and praising God and thanking God, this would probably be, off the top of our head, the last book we would turn to. Because Lamentations really is just that. It's a lament. It's the prophet Jeremiah. And the city of Jerusalem was under war, under attack. It had been besieged for several months already. And it was getting ugly in town. And yet in chapter 3, verse 21 to 25, this is right in the middle. The situation is so bad in Jerusalem. It says in, 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 this, it says in Scripture that at this point the siege was so bad that parents were eating their children. And then listen to this written right in the middle of all of that. Verse 21, but this I call to my mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Boy, how do you say that in the midst of the worst period of life how do we say that God is good when things are not good steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never end they are new every morning great is your faithfulness but if we continue to read it, it continues to be quite interesting verse 26 it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Have you ever felt like you're talking to God and asking and asking and you just have to wait? Scripture says that's a good thing. Verse 27, it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. The hard things, the struggle things, the hard work, the, the, the pushing against says that's good. Verse 28, it's good to sit alone in silence. It's good to be alone and in solitude when it's laid on him. Verse 29, it is good when my mouth is in the dust. Eat dirt. When I'm face down and I got nothing. It is good. 
Verse 30 says it's good if you give your cheek to someone who strikes it. Let him be filled with insults. Is it good when people insult you? Is it good when someone's attacking you? That's what God says. What do we do with scripture like this? Because when this is me, I, this, isn't, this isn't good, <laughs> right? It's good for you, God says. So either my definition of good is different or God is up to something that I can't see. Is it good? Then all I can do is trust. Maybe, maybe everything that comes our way Good or bad, maybe everything that comes our way can be a refiner's fire, purifying us, challenging us, drawing us closer in relationship, making us more like Christ. Everything, good or bad, could do that. Or, if we choose, everything that comes our way, good or bad, could build a a root of bitterness or harden our hearts or give us distance from him. Look at verse 32 and 33. But though he, meaning God, causes grief, he will have compassion according to his abundance, the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. I struggled with that this week. Because it says here really clearly that God causes grief. God brings affliction. But it says that's not his heart. It's not from the depths of his heart. So what does that mean? That phrase, as I fought with it and struggled with it, and I read and I read and I read, I came to this conclusion after going back, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't know the Hebrew, but it was originally written in Hebrew, and so I go back to the tools I have that help me understand the Hebrew, and this is what that literally means. It says God gives grief, right? It says this, if what he does grieves you, if what God does grieves you, that tells me that that. In the big picture of his loving kindness, it might, it might be a really good thing, but right now for me, <laughs> this is hard. Right now this is killing me. He does not afflict from his heart, it says. Affliction and heartache are not God's heart. He doesn't willingly do that, but it says there's purpose in his work. It's not something he loves to do, but he does. And it hurts, but he is good. I don't know where you are this morning, uh, but if you will trust God, then I believe that, that mercy is in your life right now. That it's all over your life. That mercy and design and God's compassionate design is there. Peter Marshall, do you know who Peter Marshall Uh, Peter Marshall wrote several books. He was a pastor. Uh, He said, life is hard and God is good. Life is hard and God is good. I think that's the meaning of the book of Lamentations. Stuff happens. Life is hard, but God is good. I think that's, that's a lot to do with the meaning of the book of Job. We see it in David in his life. We see it in Elijah in his life. We see it in Joseph. We see it in Jesus. Jesus in the garden, about to be arrested, beaten, killed. He knew what God was up to. And because of that, he could say, not my will, but yours be done. So what if we don't know what God is up to? What if we can't see what God is doing? It's hidden from us. And it's grieving me because it's hard If I knew what God was doing, it may not change the situation, but it would change me. Max Licato wrote, what is coming will make sense of what is happening now. Let God finish his work. Let the composer complete his symphony. The forecast is simple. Good days, bad days. But God is in all days. 
He is the Lord of the famine and the feast, and he uses both to accomplish his will. What God is up to is not always visible. I'm not sure God's plan or his goodness was visible to Joseph the night after he was sold by his brothers. But he knew it later in his life. I'm, I'm sure that, um, that David wasn't necessarily seeing God's goodness or God's overall plan when he had been anointed by as king, but was running from, for his life and hiding and living in caves. I'm not sure Moses would tell you what God was up to with clarity when he ran from Egypt and lived in the wilderness for 40 years. Are you okay with that? Or do we struggle with that? Are you okay with God allowing men to make the decision to sell their brother so that years later God could save a whole nation? Are you okay with that? What if it was you, abandoned by your family? What if it was you? Do we let God make his plan come good? That's hard. Are you okay with God allowing a foreign evil king to come and take over the city of Jerusalem and demolish it so that years later it would bring renewal and spiritual newness to the nation? Are we okay with stories like Joni Erickson or, or even Helen Keller? Look what God did because of the affliction. Maybe it's different when it's someone else. But when it's me, am I okay with physical ailments in my life if God is doing something in your life? Rudy, I don't know if you said it first service, or this service or not. I remember first service, you said you're closer to God now than you've ever been. What if God is bringing all of this for that? What if, am I okay with chronic pain if God was doing something in someone's life who was close to me? What I'm trying to say is that God, as it says in Lamentations, there will always be mercy and loving kindness attached. It's always there. If he causes grief, then he will have mercy according to his unchanging, rock-solid, unmovable, steadfast love. The question isn't, am I okay with this? The question is, do I believe Scripture? And do I trust him? Can I actually trust him with my life. And on my worst day, on the worst day of my life, can I stand and say, this I recall to mind, and therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore I have hope in him. In the middle of the story of Job, after Job had lost everything, and then it got worse, and then it got worse. In the middle of that, in chapter 9, Job says this. He stands up and says, I say I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face, and be of good cheer. There's two ways to look at that. Either I just fake it, and put on my smiley face, and come and clean up, and everything's great, and nobody knows. That's not what's going on. We all know Rudy. That's Rudy's verse. And it's authentic. It's real. It's not fake. It's true and it's an honest outlook on life that in the midst of trouble, God is still good. Because I know that God is good. Because I trust him implicitly. I will choose to live from that perspective. Verse 41, back to Lamentations. It says, let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. In the middle of this, in the middle of this chaos and disaster, let us lift up our hearts and hands together. Look at verse 49. My eyes will flow without ceasing. You know what that means. I can't stop crying. This is horrible. In verse 55, I called your name, O God, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. You came when I called you. And said, do not fear. God's presence. God is there. And I don't know if you're in a pit 
like that this morning or not. I hope you're hearing what scripture says. God has not abandoned you. In fact, God is with you. And God is still good. But not all of us are, are in that situation this morning. Some of you are having the best time of your life and everything's wonderful and great. Um, you know, I talked about Barry and, and Word of Life receiving that, that, uh, that huge gift. Wow, what a great problem to have. Matt, you know, longing to, to become a pastor, to go to Bible college, to start that and hear what a perfect opportunity. Peter and Maria this morning with Gideon. There's great things happening. God is good. In the times of great blessing and happiness and joy and thanksgiving, God is good. In the times of distress, when things have changed, but God has not. God is good. If you have a Bible, go over to Matthew chapter 20. Let me, let me wrap things up with this. I want to tell you two stories. One from scripture and one not. And I want you to see if you can tell what's common in both of them, okay? In Matthew chapter 20, um, again, probably not the first place you would go when we're talking about God being good, but I I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 20, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers a day's wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again at the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And at the eleventh hour of the day, he went out and found still others standing and said, why are you standing idle all day? And they said, because no one hired us. And he said to them, go into the vineyard too. And when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a full day's wage. Now those who were hired first, they thought they would receive more, but each of them received also the same. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master, saying, These last worked only one hour. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for one day's wage? Interesting here because everyone was given the same arrangement. Everyone was given the same blessing and the same opportunity and the same result. Yet some chose to take it and complain and others chose to take it and celebrate. Some see it as a blessing, some see it as a ripoff, but God's great promise was the same to everyone. The other story is from a university in Missouri, and it's a true story where the professor on the last day was exam day, and all the students gathered into the classroom to write their final exam. And uh, you can imagine them coming in and they're cramming their last minute stuff and memorizing and going through their notes and panic and anxiety and cramming. Uh, and the professor got them all seated down and reminded them that they are absolutely responsible for all of the content from the class and everything in your textbook. It's on you. It's your responsibility to know this. And then he told them to go ahead and turn over their exams and begin. And as every student turned over their, their exam... The, uh, the amazement kind of rippled through the classroom because as they turned it over, everyone's paper had already been filled in with all the right answers. Even their name was on the top of the exams. And the professor said, all of the answers are correct and you've received an A. Go and enjoy your summer. Now think about that. What if you were the one who didn't even prepare? You came in at the last minute and crammed through some of your notes. What if you were the one who worked hard all semester and you were prepared and ready? Why does one take an amazing, generous gift and grumble about it and another take the same amazing gift and celebrate? Here's what I want to say. In Christ... 
Every one of us has been given the same outrageous, extravagant, lavish, unexpected kindness and goodness. Because he is good. That's who he is. But not all of us have received it. So what do we do with that? If you're in a rough spot in life, how do you respond to God's goodness? Because it's there. If you're in a wonderful place in life, how do you resp- in life, how do you respond to God's goodness? If you're far from God, how do you respond to what God has already done? To believe that God is good all the time, I need to know him. If I don't know him, it's impossible to even watch the news because it's devastating and tragedy and hunger and terror. But when I know him, I know his love and I know his character and I know his goodness, then situations may not change. My health, my trouble, my grief may not change, but I will. This is what God's heart is. What, is God, what God's heart longs for, it's for you. Do you know him? Do you know his truth? God is good all the time. I love that this passage in Lamentation says, it is good when we have to wait for God. It's good when someone attacks us. It's good to have to bear a huge heavy burden. Because that shapes us. Because it is God at work and it will be good. It is truth. That God is good. That God gives life. That this truth brings peace and freedom and hope and promise. And the promise, the promise, we'll take the promise from Isaiah chapter 30, again in a horrible situation where all of a sudden he just breaks out in this, God is so good. In the middle of this tragedy, this is what he says, God will bring rain to your seeds. The brooks will run over with fresh water and darkness will be like noonday and we will return with singing and everlasting joy. We will obtain gladness and joy and sorrow will flee because God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. God, I guess my request for all of us this morning is that in the middle of difficulty, we would know your presence in the best day of our lives, in in great abundance and blessing, we would know your presence. That God, in times as we approach you and as we're waiting for you and as it's hard, we know you're good. But God, I ask that sometimes maybe you would pull the curtain back a little bit and let us see what you're up to. When we see what you are up to, that you are good, that you are blessing, that your mercies are new every morning, that we could stand and boldly give thanks. Boy, that's so much easier when we know what you're doing. But God, you ask us to trust you, and so we do. And so God, with a loud voice and we sh- with shouting, we say thank you for your blessing and your goodness. And all of these green cards that are here in front of us from last week, uh, um, all the yellow cards, I mean, that from last week, all these things, God, that were so awesome that we're thanking you for. God, we lift that up to you. And today, too, we say thank you because you are good. And these prayer requests from last week and the many things that are here that are written down and in our hearts and minds right now that are really difficult, God, we lift those to you and say thank you because you are good. Teach us to trust you. Teach us your ways, David said. Teach us your ways. God, may we see the great things you are doing. Thank you for those who shared today and and probably most of us here could have stood and, and, and boldly declared that you are good. And God, may we be in the habit of every morning and every evening standing and intentionally and boldly declaring that God is good giving thanks to you. 
God, would you make your mercies new every morning, make that known to us. May we see clearly. Compel us forward with your love. God is good. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.